So today we're here to discuss stop and frisk. It is a big deal when people are walking down the street and they are stopped by a police officer and police officers on a regular basis, not only here in New York, but around the United States of America, abuse their power, especially with people of color, people who are minorities, but it, it could be an abuse of almost anybody. Here to break it all down for you is none other than Jake Hudner, one of our fabulous criminal defense attorneys here at Spar and Bernstein. He's here to break down stop and frisk, what the police can do, what the police can't do, and something called the Terry Rule, which we're going to get into in a minute. But Jake, you know, everybody always asks the same question all the time. When can a cop stop me on the street and what should I do? Sure. Um, police have the right to stop us on the street and ask us questions as long as the reason that they're doing it isn't impermissible. Uh, race is the biggest example. They can't just walk down the street and only stop people of color or only stop women. Um, they are allowed to do fact finding to help do their jobs. The important thing that people need to know is when they're free to leave uh, and when they're not free to leave. So when are you free to leave uh, a stop? For example, you know, I was in the back of a car and the police stopped the car. True story, last week. Had nothing to do with me. I was in an Uber. And the police stopped it. And I rolled down the window after like five minutes. I said, officer, am I free to leave? And he goes, yes, you can leave. So I asked, but when? And I left. I'm like, I'm getting out of here. Okay. But uh, true story. Uh, I don't know what the Uber, I don't know why they were pulling the Uber driver sure. over, but yeah. I didn't want to get involved in it. Did you give him my card? No, I, no, I should have. <laughs> um, when are you free to leave? Sure. So there's two times when you're not free to leave. That's the important thing to keep in mind. And uh, the first is obviously arrest when police have probable cause that a crime has been committed or is being committed. Uh, that language comes from the Fourth Amendment uh, to the Constitution. And the other time, which is what we're talking about tonight, uh, Terry stops or stop and frisk, is when the police have reasonable suspicion that a crime has been committed or is about to be committed. So if, if the police do not have a, re a reasonable suspicion they don't have the right to stop you. Is that correct? They don't have the, the right to detain you. To detain you. Yes. They have the right to stop anybody as long as it is a random stop? Not, an imp not impermissible, not based on race. Uh, as, long as, as long as it's not based on race or religion right. or, 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 or sexual orientation or the same things that you can't do to, to like, says, fire somebody in the workplace. Absolutely. Correct? And again, an absolute reasonable suspicion or probable cause, you are free to say, no, officer, I don't want to talk to you and walk away without, a ru without raising their suspicion further. So now, um, so now you say, okay, the, let's assume the officer says, I'm stopping you because I have a reasonable suspicion mm -hmm. that a crime is afoot. Yes. Okay. What is a reasonable suspicion? A reasonable suspicion has been uh, determined to be specific, articulable facts uh, that the police officer can point to that a crime uh, was being committed. Um, something didn't look right, but it, it has to be, the, the, the Supreme Court used really good language, and we'll talk about the history of the case. They said it has to be more than a hunch. So, so articulable means that you have to say, I saw a gun. I saw blood coming down from his clothes, and right. there was somebody that was murdered a block away. You have to be able to say something more than he looked like a shady character. Yeah, or, it, or it felt off. Or something right. felt off. Something right. felt funny. That would not hold up in court afterward. Okay. So now you said the Supreme Court, and, and right behind us I see there's a guy getting, getting arrested right there. Now the Supreme Court... Um, the Supreme Court in 1968, I believe, is that right? Yes. In 1968, they came down with the Terry decision. I, I don't remember. It was Terry versus somebody. Ohio. Ohio. Terry versus Ohio. And they came down and they said, this is what, this is w what a police officer can and can't do in a stop. Tell us about yes. it. Um, and that was a very interesting time in the 60s. A lot of opinions were giving more rights to defendants, but this actually gave a little bit more right to police. Uh, in 1963, a police officer was by a store. Three men kept walking by. Uh, they'd stand on a different corner. They'd look inside. They'd start to walk to the store. They'd walk away. They were acting rather suspicious, and they were doing it over and over and over again. Um, they approached the store. The police officer stopped them and detained them briefly and conducted a pat down and felt a, uh, a revolver in one of the, probably Terry, in his pocket. Um, they were charged with attempted robbery 
and the admission of the gun held up in court, and it went all the way up to the Supreme Court five years later. And, and the it, Supreme Court said what? They said, this is okay, and they gave us this term, reasonable suspicion. Because there was a reasonable suspicion that they were walking back and forth, yes. that, that, there was, that there was potentially something was yeah, going to happen. Yeah, they were on different sidewalks, and they'd get back together. They were, they were basically casing They were casing the out the joint. Yes. Okay, so now, what about the pat-down? Because there was a stop, mm -hmm. And then there was then there's the pat down, okay? Because you there's there's you know you get stopped as long as you're not for race, religion, you, whether you're a man or a woman, sexual orientation, age. They can stop and ask questions. Now they have to let you go. This is what we've learned. They have to let you go unless they have a reasonable suspicion that a crime is afoot or a crime just happened. A reasonable suspicion has to be something more than a hunch, something more than they look suspicious. Well, why did they look suspicious? So now let's assume, like in this Terry case, that I'm walking down the street and I'm casing out the joint and the cop is able to articulate properly that it looks like I'm casing out the joint to rob it. When is he allowed to pat me down? Sure. And during this stop? So this is where stop and frisk is most abused. Uh, a, a officer truly can only uh, pat you down when he fears that you're about to commit a violent crime or he has reason to believe uh, that you're armed. So in the case of Terry, the idea is if you're going to hold up a store, you need a weapon to do that. But truly, and again, this is where stop and frisk is abused, uh, mostly in, in urban settings by police, uh, to really move to that stop down, you can't just be um, investigating drug possession, you can't just be investigating turnstile jumping, um, but this is where this is most abused. Police routinely move to that pat down when really they, they can only move to that pat down when they are able to point to articulable facts that the person is armed or about to do something violent. So unless the cop believes and can articulate that this person looks, looks you just can't say he looked dangerous, mm -hmm. okay? But that he can articulate that, I, uh, that there was some fact that would lead me to believe that he has a weapon. Yes. That, and only under those circumstances would he be able to pat you down yes. before he actually arrests you. Yes. And in fact, there's even um, th there's cases where an officer feels what is very... Uh, uh, they're not necessarily allowed to go in the pocket, but if they can feel in the pocket what is clearly drugs, truly they're not allowed to go in and get that because it's, it's not a weapon. Right, and so they can't manipulate things over the pocket. It has to be readily apparent that it's a weapon. So there's, and, and this is abused, you know, folks are probably surprised to hear this because this is most. This happens to people every day on the yes. street. They get abused, they get frisked, they get stopped, and, and rights are being violated. And it's good to know what your rights are. And, and quite frankly, when your rights are being violated on the street and the cop is doing this, there's really, you don't really have a lot you can do. I mean, you could say, hey, stop it, I know my rights. But the cop may or may not do it anyway. The cop may just violate your rights in any event. The, the playing field evens out once you get into a courtroom and you have a good lawyer who knows what rights you have and can articulate that. We're going to use the word articulate again. Mm -hmm. Articulate that to a judge and say, hey, my client's rights were violated. This whole case should be thrown out. Absolutely. Now, all of this, you know, during the Giuliani administration and certainly a lot through the Bloomberg administration, um, in New York City, and we, you know, we're in New York City, but this goes around the entire United States. They were, there was a very long time that cops were stopping young men in the street, mostly color, Hispan of color or Hispanic origin, mm -hmm. and they were stopping them for no articulable reason and frisking them. Yes. And a lot of innocent people, okay, this is no shock, a lot of innocent people went to jail. And a lot of people went to jail that shouldn't have if their rights had not been violated. Mm -hmm. Now, something happened in 2013 in New York that changed it. Yes. Okay, what happened? It sort of came to a boiling point, and a district, federal district court judge uh, struck down the NYPD's application of stop and frisk and said, not, now it's important, they didn't strike down Terry, right, but they said that the way New York City was doing it was wrong. And so what was New York City doing wrong, and now what do they have to do f moving from 2013 moving forward? Namely, two things were wrong. A disproportionate application to young men of color, and two, moving to that pat-down absent the, 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 the notion that the person is dangerous or has a weapon. Right. So the judge said uh, NYPD must, 
ordered them to put policies in place uh, to, to better decide when to apply Terry, and that was eventually upheld by the, the Second Circuit. What were the policies that you can articulate now? I love using that word, articulate. Sure, what did those policies that New York cops have to do now on the streets in a stop? Right. Well, New York NYPD actually has a very good Terry stop manual in place now that officers are go through in training to learn exactly about not only the history of Terry, just as if they were in law school, but the way to... Um, best apply it. And in fact, uh, many groups are arguing that this has uh, led to the recent reduction in crime in New York City, that police officers are... It's, ca it's counterintuitive, but makes sense. It does, in so far, and for some of the reasons they point to it, is that uh, police officers are better allocating their resources. They're not stopping people that um, aren't doing anything wrong. Uh, it's less innocent people sitting in jail clogging up the courts, um, and it's actually stopping people that are doing something wrong. So it's actually an effective deterrent when it's applied appropriately. So adhering to this fundamental constitutional principle is reducing crime in, in urban areas. So now you're, you are a criminal defense attorney here at Spartan Bernstein. It's not, everybody has seen you time and time again here on the Brad Show Live. You do a fantastic job for our clients here. I am sure Throughout your career, you have seen this plenty of times where your clients have come to you and you said, wait a second, this violated the Terry rule. This may have even violated New York's, the district court's rule that says New York City is, is, is illegally stopping and frisking young men of color and, and, and Hispanic origin. Where have you seen this in your practice of law representing clients who call us here at Spar and Bernstein? Where have you used this practically to get somebody off? Because again, Again, when your rights are being violated on the street, there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, the police have the power over you. It evens out, the playing field evens out when you got a, gr I don't want to say great, a very good, you can't say great, but a very, very good lawyer like Jake Hudnut, like Jake Hudnut um, representing you. Tell us, tell us, tell us, tell us about that. Absolutely. I think the way that a doctor takes your temperature when you go there sick, um, a good criminal defense attorney reads the police report first and looks for why did the police stop you in the first place. Um, so Terry comes into play all the time. Um, so many of the calls we get after these segments, uh, the first thing we do is go to, well, why were you stopped in the first place? Because if we can beat it there, then we can beat the whole thing. Um, uh, so we're constantly looking at that. I had a, a case once where, very similar to the, the men in Terry, I had a client that was just going in and out of his home repeatedly. And police had been across the street doing a stakeout because they received a, a tip that there was drug activity going on. Um, they approached my client. Uh, Terry has since been extended to areas within your reach when you're in an automobile. So they searched him and the areas within his reach and in the glove box were a large amount of drugs repackaged for sale. But he didn't give them permission to go search that glove no, box. No, it, it was a Terry stop by way of Terry has is, is since been extended to... To, pull, to, cop, to cars. Uh, yes, when you're in the car. Right, yeah. right, right. But, um, but you would have to, but in absence some reasonable suspicion that there's a crime afoot, they wouldn't have the right to go and look into his glove box. No, no, not in those situations where it's in front of his house like that. Right. And, but the prosecutor argued that it was a valid Terry stop. Um, he had a criminal record. He faced um, an extended term of imprisonment uh, in, in prison. Um, but through diligent motion practice, I was able to actually get a judge to put cops on the stand and say, you know what, that's not specific, that's not articulable, and uh, under Terry threw it out. Yeah, just because you have a pri uh, an extensive prior criminal uh, past doesn't mean that you're committing a crime at this very moment. Right. That's, that's absolutely no evidence that anything is happening at this very moment. Absolutely. Okay, so that's a fantastic job. Now, obviously, the guy did, in fact, have drugs in, in his car. We're not sitting here saying, we're not sitting here saying, yes, you should go around with drugs in your car. Yes, you should go break the law. What we are saying is, what's the most important thing here in the United States of America, certainly in the state of New York, in the state of New Jersey, but in every state in the United States of America, is your rights. You have a right in the United States not to be stopped and frisked. You have a right in the United States not to be stopped because you look like a person who may be committing a crime. You, ha you have the right in the United States not to be stopped and frisked because you look like different than the cop. 
You have a right not to be stopped and frisked because you're a person of color, or you're Hispanic, or you look like an immigrant, or you look like a minority, or you just because you're walking down the street and the cop didn't like the way you looked. He has to have an articulable reason to stop you, to, to go beyond the stopping you, to, to frisk you, to pat you down in case he thinks you have a weapon. And all of these things are your rights to privacy that you have in the United States, to be left alone by police, to not have police uh, overbear on you. So when these things happen, obviously on the streets, you can't stop it. But what you can do is have good criminal defense lawyers at your ready, by your side, God forbid these things happen. And these things happen every day still. So what I tell everybody out there is save our telephone number. You never know when you're going to need very good criminal defense attorneys. Not only do we got Jake Hudnut here, not only do we got David Moreno here, Paul Hirsch here, all fabulous criminal defense attorneys. Save our number. The telephone number is one 800 Five two nine five four six five. That's one eight zero zero Law Link. One eight zero zero five two nine five four six five. And I tell everybody the best way to save our telephone number is literally dial it. Pick up the phone, dial the number, hang up, and you have good criminal defense attorneys safe for life. Because on the street, they're going to violate your rights. But you know what? As soon as you get to that police station, you don't say anything. You just say, "I want to call my lawyer." One eight hundred Law Link. And we'll be there, gonna, and then the playing field gets evened out. Jay Cudnut, fabulous job Thank as you. always. Thank you. Really informative, and uh, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thank you.